If you were to Google the most dangerous job, you'd find that the most dangerous job in all the world is that of a lumberjack. What do you think the most dangerous job was in ancient Israel? Well, we're going to see from our study today that it was that of being God's prophet. And at the end of the video, we'll consider a question that has come in as to whether or not it's right to celebrate Christmas and Easter. Please join us for our study. Thank you for joining me as we continue studying through Mark. Please open your Bibles to Mark 6, and we're going to begin our study today in a few moments in verse 17. Last week, we noted how that Jesus sent his 12 apostles out on what's been called the limited commission. They were to go only to the Jews and preach that God's kingdom was near and that they needed to repent. Jesus continued his ministry of preaching and healing, and people had various reactions to Jesus and uh, debated as to who exactly he was. Some people thought that Jesus was John the Baptist having been raised from the dead and that that was why he was performing miracles. And in fact, one person who thought that was Herod. Today in our text, we're going to study the backstory of that. We're going to notice the circumstance in which Herod had John the Baptist put to death. Let's begin our reading in verse 17. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. So the background of Herod's execution of John was Herod's marriage to Herodias. Now before we talk about Herod's marriage to Herodias, let's talk just a little bit about Herod. Now Herod's father was also named Herod, Herod the Great. And he ruled Jewish territory under Rome until his death in 4 BC. And at his death in 4 BC, his kingdom was divided up between three of his sons. His son Archelaus, who is also mentioned in Matthew chapter 2, ruled over the area of Judea and Samaria. And he ruled for only 10 years. He only ruled until 6 AD. And at his death, uh, his territory was placed under the control of a series of Roman governors. And in fact, one in that series of Roman governors was Pontius Pilate, who, as we know, uh, condemned Jesus to be crucified. Another portion of Herod's kingdom was given to one of his sons named Herod Philip. Now, this Herod Philip is not the same Philip that we read about here in Mark 6 and verse 17. It was a different Philip. You see, a couple of Herod's sons had the same name, but they had different mothers. Now, Herod Philip is mentioned in Luke chapter 3 and verse 1, but he ruled over territory that was outside of uh, the land of the Jews. And then a part of Herod's territory was given to the Herod that we're reading about here, who's uh, also called Herod Antipas. And Herod Antipas ruled over Galilee and Perea. Perea was territory to the east of the Jordan River. And Herod Antipas ruled from 4 BC until AD 39. Now, uh, he's called in this text king. Remember, we noted that uh, last week, verse 14, King Herod. Now, he was popularly known as king, but that wasn't his technical title. His technical title is what he's called in Matthew and also in Luke, it's Tetrarch. And Tetrarch just means ruler over a fourth part. Well, uh, the story of Herod's marriage to his brother Philip's wife, who's called Herodias, is actually not just uh, uh, spoken of in uh, the Bible, but it's also spoken of outside of the Bible. Last week I read to you a passage from Josephus in which he talked about Herod's execution of John the Baptist. But today I want to read you a passage from Josephus in which Josephus talks about Herod's marriage to Herodias. And it's found in, in uh, book 18 of Josephus' work, Antiquities of the Jews. And here's what he says beginning in section 109 of book 18. In the meantime... A quarrel, whose origin I shall relate, arose between Aretas, king of Petra, 
I'm going to stop there and just mention the fact that this Aretas, king of Petra, or king over the Arabian territory, is also mentioned in the New Testament. Uh, you can read about him in the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And Herod. Now this is, this is Herod Antipas. The tetrarch Herod had taken the daughter of Aretas as his wife and had now been married to her for a long time. When starting out for Rome, that is, Herod Antipas is leaving uh, Galilee. Uh, he ruled in the city of Tiberias. He's leaving Galilee and he's headed for the city of Rome. He lodged with his half-brother Herod. Now, his half-brother Herod uh, is the Philip that we're reading about here in Mark 6, verse 17. They had the same father, but they had different mothers. Who was born of a different mother? Well, just what I said. Namely, the daughter of Simon, the high priest. Falling in love with Herodias, that is, Herod Antipas, falls in love with his brother's wife. Her name is Herodias. Falling in love with Herodias, the wife of his half-brother. She was a daughter of their brother Aristobulus and sister of Agrippa the Great. Now, by the way, this Agrippa the Great is also mentioned in the New Testament. He's Herod Agrippa I that we read about in Acts 12, the one who had James executed and intended on executing Peter. He brazenly broached to her the subject of marriage. That is, Herod Antipas broached the subject of marriage with his uh, brother's wife, Herodias. She accepted and pledged herself to make the transfer to him as soon as he returned from Rome. It was stipulated that he must oust the daughter of Aretas. The agreement was made, he set self for Rome, and we could continue the story. Uh, but, but that's the circumstance. So uh, Herod is married to the daughter of uh, King Aretas, and uh, Herodias is married to Philip, Herod's brother. They fall in love with one another. Herod agrees to divorce uh, the daughter of King Aretas. Herodias agrees to divorce Philip, and they agree to marry one another, and that's exactly what they did. And it was because of that marriage that uh, Herod ended up arresting John the Baptist. Now why? What did John the Baptist do that made Herod uh, arrest him over the marriage? Well, let's read the next verse, and we're told, verse 18 of Mark 6. For John had been saying to Herod, now the tense shows it's not just once, this is multiple times, John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Okay, so there's a good bit we've got to unpack here. We need to consider, first of all, what does it mean that it was not lawful? What law are we talking about? And then we need to consider the question, well, why was it not lawful? And I think that we have to see that since, you know, Herod... Uh, not Herod, excuse me, John was a prophet of God, an Old Testament prophet. The law that, uh, that he's saying it was not lawful under was the law of Moses. Now some people say, well, how could it be the law of Moses? Because uh, we know that Herod was not a Jew. Herod rather was a descendant of Esau. He was an Idumean. And so why would uh, John, this prophet of the Old Testament, tell Herod that your marriage is not lawful under the Old Testament. Well, we've got to keep history in mind. Even though it is true the Herods were descendants of Esau, they were Idumeans, uh, they also were considered proselytes to the Jewish religion. Because you see, in the past, in, in that period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, John Hyrcanus who uh, ruled over the Jews, he actually conquered the descendants of Esau. And he allowed them to stand in their land under one condition, that they willingly submit themselves to circumcision and that they agree to keep aspects of Moses' law. Now you can read about this also in Josephus, in his Antiquities, book 13 of his Antiquities. And so from that time on, from the time of John Hyrcanus on, the Herods were considered to be Jews. They were considered to be proselytes because they'd been circumcised and they agreed to keep the law of Moses. In fact, if we just continue reading in our New Testaments, we'll see that a niece of Herodias, uh, whose name was Drusilla, 
mentioned in Acts 24, verse 24, is described as being Jewish. And then her brother, a nephew of Herodias, mentioned in Acts chapter 26, his name is Herod Agrippa II, the father of, or excuse me, the son of Herod Agrippa I. Uh, Paul says to him, Herod, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe the prophets. Acts 26 and 27. That is 26 verse 27. And, and so you see, even though the Herods were descendants of Esau, uh, they had committed themselves to living like Jews. And so John says it's not lawful under the law of Moses for you to have your brother's wife. So that raises the question, well, what about the marriage was not in accordance with the law of Moses? Well, a lot of people today will look at this and they'll say, okay, uh, the reason why the marriage was unlawful is because it was adulterous. Herod had left his wife and Herodias had left her husband and they'd married one another and so the marriage was itself adulterous. And so that's why John says you've got to break it up. And so a lot of people will use this as a justification for going to people today and saying to them, listen, uh, you're in an adulterous marriage, and before you can be baptized, you've got to repent of that adulterous marriage, and the way that you repent of it is get out of it because John said to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. But what we have to understand is that such was not unlawful under the law of Moses. The law of Moses never commanded that marriages that were quote-unquote adulterous be broken up for repentance to occur. Let me read to you from Deuteronomy chapter 24 because this is the relevant text, you know, whenever this is asserted uh, from, from the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 24 says... If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house, and if after she leaves his house she becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house, or if he dies... Then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. So when we look at this passage, we see that the passage is written to forbid one thing. What it's written to forbid is a divorced woman after she's remarried from being remarried by her first husband. And we ask, well, what's the circumstance in which the first husband divorces her? It's described in the text as something indecent that he finds in her. But we have to understand that that something indecent must be something less serious than her adultery. Because two chapters earlier, Deuteronomy 22.22, 22, Moses commanded the death penalty for a woman who would commit adultery against her husband. So it must be something less serious. But Moses holds out the possibility that a woman divorced for a reason less serious than adultery might go out and might marry another man. But what's significant is that that marriage is described as being legitimate in that Moses never commands that second marriage to be ended in divorce. Now, he could have. He could have commanded that just as easily as he prohibited her if that second marriage were to end from going back to her first husband. But he didn't. And so you search the Old Testament from beginning to end and you don't find quote-unquote adulterous marriages as being labeled unlawful and needing uh, to be ended for repentance to occur. And so it just doesn't seem likely that that is what John is giving as his basis for saying to Herod and Herodias, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. I think rather the, uh, the answer to our question is found by noticing carefully what's said. John said to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. You see, the Old Testament forbade a marriage between a man and his brother's wife. Consider Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus 20 and verse uh, 21. 
if I can find it. There it is. There Moses wrote, If a man marries his brother's wife, it is an act of impurity. He has dishonored his brother. They will be childless. Now, of course, Deuteronomy 25 verses 5 through 10 says that if a man is married to a woman and he dies before he has children with her, then his living brother is to marry his widow and the first child that's to be born is to be considered the child of the deceased brother. So the Old Testament law did allow men to marry their brother's wife if their brother died and their brother died childless. But it was law unlawful, according to the Old Testament, for a man to marry his brother's wife. And by the way, when Josephus reflects on this marriage between Herod and Herodias, that's the point of criticism. In uh, Josephus, uh, again, book 18 of his Antiquities, section 136, here's what he says. Their sister Herodias was married to Herod, the son of Herod the Great by Mariamne, daughter of Simon the high priest. They had a daughter, Salome, after whose birth Herodias, taking it in, into her hands, to flout the way of our fathers, married Herod, her, uh, her husband's brother, by the same father who was Tetrarch of Galilee. And earlier in uh, Josephus' Antiquities, in book 17, he makes the point that it was an abomination to the Jews for a man to marry uh, his brother's wife. And so that's the point of criticism. The problem with the marriage is not that it's adulterous, though that obviously was involved sin, no denying that, but the problem with the marriage, the reason the marriage was unlawful and couldn't continue was because it was incest, condemned by Moses' law. All right, so let's uh, go back to our text in Mark 6, and let's read verse 19. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. The drama between Herod, Herodias, and John reminds me of the drama in the Old Testament between King Ahab, his wife Jezebel, and the prophet Elijah. Remember how Jezebel hated Elijah and tried to kill Elijah? Well, Herodias hates John because John is saying that her marriage to Herod is not lawful. Now, she shouldn't have hated John. She may not have liked what John said, but what John said was in her best interest. She should have understood the truth that uh, Paul spoke in Galatians 4.16 when he said, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? No, the person who tells us the truth, even if it's an uncomfortable truth, is our best friend. But uh, Herod won't allow Herodias to follow through on her uh, murderous hatred of John because Herod recognizes John as a prophet. And he's afraid to do anything against John. He's afraid of John. I mean, he has John arrested, but he's afraid to put John to death. But Herod is really puzzling. Herod likes to listen to John preach, but he's not about to do what John says. Kind of reminds me of those Jews at the end of Ezekiel chapter 33, who uh, the text says, love to hear Ezekiel preach. In fact, Ezekiel's sermons were to them like a song, but they weren't about to do what Ezekiel said. All right, verse 21. Finally, the opportune time came on his birthday Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and leading men of Galilee. Well, obviously, it's the leading men of Galilee because that's the territory over which Herod rules. And celebrating his birthday, this reminds me of the story in the Old Testament in Genesis 40, verse 20, of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. You remember how Pharaoh had a great uh, celebration on his birthday? Well, the same now with Herod. Verse 22, when the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. Now, the New Testament never gives us the name of Herodias' daughter. But remember, we read her name in Josephus. Her name is Salome, the daughter of Herodias through her first husband, Philip. 
So Salome is the entertainment. She comes in and she dances. Now, what's interesting is a consideration as to how old Salome was. Uh, this verse says, the king said to the girl. Now, the word that's translated girl there uh, comes from a Greek word, karasion. And uh, it's the word that we found back in Mark 5 and verse uh, 41 where Jesus took, you remember the 12-year-old daughter of Jairus? He took her by the hand and said, Talitha kum, which means little girl. That's a form of that word, karasion, I say to you, get up. And so uh, Salome isn't very old. Uh, she's probably only 12, 13, something like that. And she dances. But the implication seems to be that she gives this seductive dance. But, you know, that's certainly in line with the character of the Herods that we read about in the Bible and also in uh, Josephus. So uh, Herod and everybody is pleased by the entertainment. They're pleased by Salome's dance. And Herod says, ask for me anything you want and I'll give it to you. And then he strengthens that offer in verse 23. We're told that he promised her on an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. Now, uh, Herod rules under Rome. Herod doesn't have the right to give away half of his kingdom. It's up to Rome to decide who rules. So this, uh, this oath that he says, you know, I'll give it to you up to half of my kingdom, or this promise that is, uh, is, is really just uh, a, a hyperbole that says you can have whatever you want. You know, for instance, uh, the young prophet in 1 Kings 13 verse 8 says to King Jeroboam, even if you were to offer me half of your possessions, or um, King Xerxes says to Esther, in Esther 7 verse 2, you know, ask whatever you want up to half my kingdom. So he says the same thing. So it probably just means I'll give you whatever you want. All right, verse 24. She went out and said to her mother, so she leaves the banquet hall. She goes and says to her mother, you know, there may be uh, one banquet for the men and a separate banquet for the women. And says to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried to the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Well, this seems uh, savage. This seems inhuman. But remember, Herodias is driven by this hateful grudge against Herod. And, and by the way, we see similar things other places. Uh, for instance, when uh, Jehu is raised up to destroy Ahab's family and to become king, he sends from Jezreel to Samaria and he says, listen, you need to behead all 70 of Ahab's sons who are there in Samaria and bring me the heads. And that's exactly what happened. The leaders of Samaria beheaded all 70 of Ahab's sons, put the heads in a basket and sent the a basket full of heads uh, to Jehu. So that was uh, something that was not unheard of in the ancient world. Verse 26. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oath and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. Now, he should have refused her. You know, he should have allowed uh, whatever uh, little bit of righteousness resided in his heart to win out, and he should have broken that oath. But he doesn't. Pride causes him to uh, follow through on this foolish promise that he's made. Verse 27. So he immediately sent an executioner with the orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. Well, how do you think revenge felt to Herodias? She got what she wanted, but you know, revenge never brings the satisfaction that we think that it's going to bring. And we know that this caused Herod problems. It seems like Herod uh, had feelings of guilt over having executed John because, again, when Herod hears about Jesus and the miracles that Jesus is performing, he's thinking, well, Herod has come back, and that's why these miracles are being performed. Verse 29, On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. So even though John has been in prison... Uh, John's disciples have not abandoned him. You remember in Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, John is then in prison. 
And uh, John sends a couple of his disciples to Jesus to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah we've been expecting or should we be looking for another? So even though John's in prison, John's disciples have remained loyal to him. And they're the ones who have the charge of giving him an honorable burial. Remember when John uh, was uh, born, his father, Zacharias, and his mother, Elizabeth, are presented in Luke chapter 1 as being very old. So they've probably died by now. And John was their only child. And so he has no uh, parents, he has no brothers to bury him. Rather, it's his disciples who bury him. We don't know where he was buried. Was he buried there near Macarus? Uh, on the uh, eastern side of the Dead Sea where this supposedly took place according to Josephus? Or was he carried back uh, to the hill country of Judea, which Luke chapter 1 says that his parents were from and you know, buried in some family tomb? We don't know. But Matthew's account tells us in Matthew chapter 14 verse 12 that after John's disciples uh, buried his body, that they went, then went and brought word to Jesus. Our question for today is this. In light of Romans 14, 5 and 6, is the celebration of Easter and Christmas as religious holidays a matter of conscience? Well, let's deal first with the question of what Romans 14 teaches, and then we'll deal with the question as to whether or not Easter and Christmas fall underneath that teaching. Now, here's what Romans 14, 5 and 6 say. One person considers one day more sacred than another, Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives God uh, thanks. So I think that we have to understand the background to Romans 14 to really understand what's going on. In the reign of Emperor Claudius, he ordered that all Jews, including Jewish Christians, be expelled from the city of Rome. And we read about this in the New Testament in Acts 18, verses 1 to 3. Because Aquila and Priscilla, Jewish Christians, are expelled from Rome. They go to Corinth, and that's where they meet the Apostle Paul. But when the Emperor Claudius died in AD 54, this expulsion order ceased to be in force. And so the Jews were allowed to return. And in fact, when we read Romans, Paul's letter to the church in Rome, and in Romans 16, when Paul is greeting members of the church in Rome, who does he greet? Romans 16, verses 3 to 5. He greets Aquila and Priscilla. They've been allowed to return. So the problem is this. Uh, for those years that Claudius' order was in effect, the church in Rome was a solely Gentile church. But now Jews are coming back into the church. And the Jews and the Gentiles were kept separate for years because of the teachings of the law of Moses. You remember how Paul describes the law. It's this barrier between them and the uh, Gentiles. And it was a barrier because, for instance, it forbade the Jews from eating non-kosher food, Leviticus 11. And so imagine the problem that uh, you have in the church in Rome uh, whenever you have a potluck meal. And here are the Gentiles, they're bringing all of their sausages, all their pork products, and here are the Jews who come to that potluck meal and they can't eat those things. Or imagine the tension when the leadership in the church at Rome is primarily Gentile and they call for a work day on a Saturday. What's the Jewish Christian supposed to do? And so Romans 14 is intended to teach the church in Rome you know, how to deal with those differences. And so what is said is that every person needs to respect the other person's conscience. The Gentiles need to respect the Jewish conscience. As the Jews keep these matters that weren't bound by the new covenant, but, you know, they follow because that's been their custom, you know, having been a part of the old covenant, they follow because that's their custom. The Gentiles ought to respect the Jews' conscience and not look down on them because uh, they, they won't eat sausage or because they rest on Saturday. And the Jew is to respect the Gentile and understand that uh, these are, these are non-binding matters, and so don't judge the Gentile for eating a sausage biscuit in the morning or don't judge the Gentile for doing lawn work on Saturday. So 
does the celebration of Christmas and Easter as religious holidays fall under the teaching of Romans 14? Well, as it relates to individuals, yes. If you have an individual who feels conscience-bound to remember Jesus' resurrection on Easter or to remember Jesus' birth on Christmas, then that person should be allowed to do that. I think especially of someone who has come into the church from a background in a, in a more liturgical church that's followed you know, the quote-unquote Christian calendar. I think especially about Lent. You know, um, those who all their life have fasted during Lent and not eaten meat on Fridays during Lent, that sort of thing, and then they come into the church. Uh, you know, that person may have uh, conscience issues, scruples with eating meat on Friday. Well, that person should be allowed uh, to be true to their conscience. They shouldn't be looked down upon for being true to their conscience, but they shouldn't be allowed to bind that on other people. So as it re relates to individuals, yes. But what about as it relates to a church? Does Romans 14 allow a church to celebrate Jesus' resurrection on Easter or to celebrate Jesus' birth on Christmas? Well, let me just say what we do here at Metaview. At Metaview, uh, on Easter Sunday, uh, I preach a sermon on the resurrection of Jesus, and oftentimes songs are sung that mention the resurrection of Jesus. And on the Sunday closest to Christmas, I'll preach a sermon on the birth of Jesus, and we sing songs that talk about the birth of Jesus. Now, uh, we don't do anything extra. We don't remember Jesus' resurrection with any uh, special ceremonies, and we don't remember Jesus' birth with any special ceremonies. The thing is, it is always right to study and preach about the resurrection or death of Jesus. It is always right to sing songs of praise to God over the resurrection of Jesus or birth of Jesus. That's always right, even on Easter and even on the Sunday closest to Christmas. But I do think that it's not right for a church to go beyond that and for a church to decide that it's going to introduce special ceremonies uh, to commemorate Jesus' resurrection and uh, Jesus' birth. And the reason for that is because there's no New Testament authority for it. Jesus said to the Jews who had accumulated all these traditions, Matthew 15, verse 9, in vain you worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. We have to understand uh, that this position is a position that's been held by, by many who followed Christ. Ulrich Zwingli, who was a contemporary of Luther, he believed that the church needed to follow the regulative principle. That is, you only do in church worship and church life what's authorized in the New Testament. And on that basis... Uh, he believed that it was wrong for the church to have special ceremonies to commemorate Jesus' resurrection and Jesus' birth on Easter and Christmas because he said there's no New Testament authority for it. You go down uh, in time a little bit, about a century, and you see that the uh, Presbyterians in Scotland believed that it was wrong to celebrate Easter and Christmas as a church, and the Puritans in England believed that it was wrong to celebrate Easter and Christmas. In fact, the Scottish Parliament in 1640 outlawed celebrating Easter and Christmas. In fact, here's what they said in that uh, ruling. Quote, The church in this kingdom is purged from all superstitious observation of days. And uh, when Oliver Cromwell became the uh, uh, master protector of England, Easter and Christmas were outlawed in England during those days from 1653 to 1658. You know, add to this, we have to understand how divisive the celebration of Easter and Christmas have been through the centuries. Let's just focus on Easter because Easter uh, began to be celebrated much earlier than what Christmas was. But uh, the celebration of Easter brought a great deal of division in the church because uh, you know, Easter not being taught in the Bible, there was controversy over when and how it was to be celebrated. You see, those in the East believed that Easter uh, ought to be celebrated according to the Jewish calendar on the uh, day 
of uh, the Jewish Passover. So Nisan 14 is when uh, you commemorate Jesus' death, and then, you know, three days later, Nisan 16 is when you commemorate Jesus' resurrection. Well, those in the West differed. They said, well, Jesus was crucified on a Friday and Jesus was raised on a Sunday, so we need to remember Jesus' crucifixion on a Friday and his resurrection on a Sunday. So the Friday after Nisan 14, that's when you remember Jesus' death, you know, Good Friday. And then the Sunday after Nisan 14, that's when you remember uh, Jesus' resurrection, that is Easter Sunday. And in fact, the division got, or the, the controversy got so sharp that in 196, Victor, who was bishop in Rome, uh, he wrote uh, ordering uh, churches in the East to follow the Western practice. And when the bishop of Ephesus refused to follow the Western practice, uh, Victor of Rome excommunicated the bishop of Ephesus and excommunicated the Asiatic uh, churches for following uh, you know, their uh, timing of celebrating Easter. But, but you know, here's the thing. Whenever you depart from the New Testament teaching, you're, you're going out on opinion. And when you go out on opinion, you've got to understand everybody's got differences of opinion. And so it will always be the case whenever we go beyond the New Testament, there's going to be division because everybody's going to think their opinion ought to be followed. Wouldn't it be better just to stick to the simple teaching of the New Testament? Only when we stick to the simple teaching of the New Testament can we really have unity. Thank you for studying the Bible with me today. If you found this video helpful, please like it. And if you've not yet subscribed to MetaView's YouTube channel, please take the time to do so now. I look forward to being with you next week. God bless you.